Cultural Leaders is a series of conversations that I'm having with people from the worlds of art and design, music, technology and sport. I feel with you, you're not that obvious a cart person. <laughs> yeah, no, I definitely had to uh, tone down the accent in Germany, Jesus, if they couldn't understand the word I was saying when I was trying to present over there. It's really important that we do share these stories and that we pass them on generation to generation. I would encourage young people when they get that feeling of fear to step into it, step into fear every single time. Now is democratise how and when we consume content. It also offers opportunities to creators and creative talent, which I think is great. It's not just an entertainment platform, but I feel like it can also be an educational platform if you want it to be. The No Sky Cinema membership is like a library. It's full of old archive movies like The Quiet Man, Back to the Future, and more up-to-date modern blockbusters like Spider-Man and Star Wars. So there's a great archive of rich films that we can all relate to from our youth, as well as newer editions of those films as well. You don't have to take my word for it. You can sign up today for a free seven-day trial and explore the library of entertainment, action, and education. Neil Patrick Collins tells us about growing up in the shadows of Castlereagh Prison in Roscommon, kicking stray footballs back over the wall so prisoners could continue to play. We discuss inter-county football, the art of defending, and what inspires him to create art from his Dublin studio. Neil, thanks for joining us. You're there in your studio, your work, your, your workplace. We will, in the course of the chat, we'll talk about everything from school to sport to uh, your art. I wanted to start off with the idea of the, ho- the home, and at the moment, like home is kind of like a, for some people, is almost a prison, right? And people are kind of contained and cocooning and whatnot. Um, you're from a town in Roscommon, which is a prison town. I wonder, I wondered um, what effect that might have had on you as a person growing up, and what kind of impact it might have had on how, how the type of person you've become. Yeah, definitely. Uh, across, I can see the prison from my house. I can see the prison lights from from my house. It's it's actually there's only a, only fields in between my house and a train track. There's only fields in the train tracks in between my house and the prison. So it's it's the nearest thing in some ways. Um, and when we were younger, we would often run up there and, and take footballs from uh, the, the footballs that would be kicked over the walls. We'd go up and kind of steal them. So um, that's how, like, I suppose, sport, it was almost like we were, like, taking some of their freedom when they were kicking the footballs over, we'd always take their like symbol of freedom and use it for our own play. Um, so I suppose you would be very aware of the of maybe what it you'd you'd sort of try and embody what it may be like to be inside those walls and to be to have your freedom and autonomy restricted. So um, I guess it probably did maybe impact on me in some ways not that i was madly conscious of it at the time yeah it's it's um it's just get, getting to know you and i know that you travel you lo- you love to travel you're well traveled and you're highly creative and i do wonder what if any impact growing up with the prison in your backyard almost uh what part that played in you being such a big traveler and being so attracted to freedom and being also a highly creative person when you're looking at people who can't really obviously can't travel but then are restricted in cr- creatively and physically and everywhere yeah and, and you know just when you're saying there about um about this time home sort of feeling like a bit of a prison and um it is something i really realized probably only in the last two or three weeks it's like the fact that as people we are very much like restricted at the moment does begin to like kind of uh, when, when you when you like to live in a in a more free sort of a way, it does kind of start to compound a little bit. Not having that that sort of abundant freedom. Yeah, I think so. I think it's really. I think some people are really living with a sense of imprisonment at the moment. You know, I was thinking of you recently. I was watching a documentary on Netflix about Tim Robbins and this program that he has implemented across the states, um, whereby creativity is used as a means of uh, rehabilitating prisoners. And I think it's a powerful idea, really, you know. Um, you obviously are now a practicing, selling commercial artist. And um, 
what do you feel about the idea of creativity in prisons and creativity being used as a form of or a means of kind of rehabilitating or, or helping prison populations? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's extremely interesting. The only, the only sort of angle I can put on it is my own and the experience that I've had um, and maybe why I came to art. Um, like, you hear this a lot. It's like that art is meditative and it's, like, it's almost like a spiritual practice in some way. Um, and I think that idea of op- as, as human beings, like we're taught to use the left side of our brain a lot, which is like the analytical brain, the brain for like getting a, a job in society. So as kids, we're not really, um, we're kind of encouraged not to use our creative brain so much. And I think after the age of maybe nine or 10, um, like a lot of kids have shut down that part of their brain. Um, so when, and when, when it's like that, like your, your perspective and the way you interact with the world, I think becomes like a little bit more, um, caged in some ways. So I think the idea of it is kind of opening up your perspective again and trying to see the world as a child again, um, um, where, where everything is possible and like your imagination is, is like running wild and open. So I think like for me, I definitely felt restricted in a lot of ways, um, sort of creatively. I was living and living and working in New York in like a very, um, a very sort of commercial um, area of fashion. And it probably just made me think like this is like I felt a little bit restricted. And I think coming to art, it's like you can do anything you want and you can kind of allow yourself to communicate from from somewhere you don't even know where you're not communicating necessarily from your brain through art you're just communicating like some energy flowing through you so i think like when people open themselves up to that it gives them like a very different experience yeah i wonder have you had you ever been on the inside were you ever allowed to uh, visit that prison as young fellas yeah 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 I remember it was the when it opened it was the most high tech prison in Ireland. Um, so um but I mean it it since is not, but at the time it was. So I remember being being in awe of that also that you that they could watch anyone. You could be watched at all times, basically, as soon as you're in within a mile of the prison. Never mind inside. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um you mentioned there your time in New York and I wanted to get to this idea of travel because you have the travel that kind of wanderlust in you I I theorize that it may be related to as I said prison out your window and this rail line I, I didn't know there was a rail track going by your house as well so I'm wondering if that subconsciously influenced influenced you as well in your desire to travel uh, you did that thing that GA players and you are a former GA player that thing that some GA players did in the summer times when maybe intercounty football ended, you went and did the New York, the New York, um, playing in New York for, for summers. Tell us a bit about that experience. Uh, yeah, it's, it's funny. Or, only in the last two or three weeks, like kind of now that I've like sort of left the football behind almost altogether. It's like, when I was looking back at the last few weeks playing in New York and Boston and Melbourne also, like, like I, I, I get just so much excitement because sometimes at the time, like you're kind of like in some ways you're playing because that's just what you do and that's what you know. And sometimes you kind of feel at the time when you're in New York, it's like, oh, I'm playing football. Like maybe I should be downtown doing something else, you know. But actually, like when I look back at it, it was such a, a beautiful time like and the Irish culture in, in those and community in those places is like very much concentrated um like it's very concentrated Irish culture um with the backdrop of being in places like Melbourne and New York so when I look back at it now like I think I learned a lot about like about Irish people Irishness and, and Irish people especially with the context of it as I said in another country who were the teams you played with and against over there? Played with Donegal uh, in Boston, New York. <laughs> um, 
and uh, I played with a team called Wolf Tones in, in Melbourne. Um, so they're they're all kind of like they they sort of all had had the northern edge to them those teams, and I I found like. I found like my madness and their sort of madness were different madnesses, but we we kind of always got on really well, you know. Yeah, you hear lots of you'd hear lots of like war stories that you know these games in New York and Chicago and Boston particularly were really physical, dangerous almost affairs. How how was that seen? Like it, uh, folklore kind of folklore would suggest that it was highly highly kind of charged. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, it was definitely it was definitely physical, and you could, you were always liable to <laughs> to get a clothesline or a box. Um, so yeah, but but not. I think it's always exaggerated a little bit, like the the, the physicality over there. Um, but 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 they can be yeah, there can be strong rivalries. I'll tell you, like a little bit more, like different rivalries to what you'd have in Ireland. Like in Ireland, it's strong rivalry, but. It's not like violent, you know. <laughs> um, whereas over there, it's almost like a bit more old-fashioned, and it's like raw, a bit more raw the rivalry, you know. So like anything could happen, which is <laughs> which is sort of exciting in some other ways, like you know. Yeah, I think it's not a bad grounding for players, actually, in a way, you know, to play there for a while. I think it gives you a bit of um, exposure to that kind of more physical stuff. Can help you a little bit when you come home. Um, I want to I want to just chat about the GA in general, uh, Neil. You had a strong had a strong intercounty career as a senior, but you you had a very strong underage career as well. Tell me about coming up in Castlereagh and the GA scene and how that fit into the Ross Common underage scene. Um, yeah, like I'm from a town, obviously, so it's like we we always just played football and soccer. We played soccer a lot when we were kids. Um, and like we we'd spend you know all our time literally just playing soccer um, and so I really loved soccer as a child but then I guess then when you turn like 16 and you want to take sports seriously um, that's when I kind of turned uh, my hands to Gaelic football and sort of at the same time like all of my friends or like all of the, the guys I played soccer with and Gaelic with underage it's almost like and they were all very good players, like maybe like some of them were as good and better than me at that stage. Um, and like, it's almost like at that stage, they all just left sport almost altogether. Um, and like, I was almost the only one then from my age group who kind of wanted to kick on a little bit and, and like sort of take it seriously. So it was, it was really interesting that there was such a core group of us. And then in the space of a year, it's like all of them had left and it was just me. So I kind of went into playing with Ross Common then on my own, um, which was maybe a good thing, actually. Because Why do you think that was? I think just the kind of um, from a town, it's like there, there's a lot of different influences and there's a lot of different kind of, there's always like group mentality, right? And, and the sports mentality is, is, is not, the, the mindset for sport is, is, sort of in contrast to the group townie mentality i think um so it's like i think a lot of those lads didn't really want to leave the, the group behind um to go and like dedicate their weekends and time to sport and I suppose like i definitely did want to do that so i think that's what it was yeah i think a lot of them in some levels wanted to play but they, they, they didn't want to leave behind the 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 group, I guess, in some ways. The gang. Mm. Yeah. So you were you were part of an you were part of a successful Ross Common underage scene, right? Yeah, yeah. Like definitely when we were when when Ross Common were like very competitive, yeah, and like yeah, starting to kind of change the tide of of what it had been before. Yeah. So you had. I'm not sure if you were there. I remember Ross Common beating Kerry. I think in an All Ireland minor final. Back yeah, around 2006. 2006, yeah, I wasn't playing then. Um, but yeah, like that was almost that was almost like the the beginning of of like Ras Common kind of 
coming up, you know, and, and, and then from there, probably had a good few strong underage teams for the next six or seven years, you know. Um, so, like, yeah, I mean, Rosh Commons kind of has changed a lot now in the last few years, where it's like they're, they're, they're probably like a top, they're, they're outside the top five, five, six, but they're definitely, you know, consistently between probably six and ten in the, in the best teams in Ireland. So, uh, it's, it's definitely been, there's definitely like been a change of emphasis down there. And it's kind of like, it was nice to see it kind of changing from, you know, probably when I started playing senior, we were not that, you know, we were not that strong. And then, you know, within two or three years, we were, you know, division one, playing division one. So that was a big switch, really, like from from where it had been for the previous ten years, which was exciting at the time. I have to say, yeah, no, definitely competitive county now, and regarded up there and with with the top counties in that bracket. You know, how, how do you look back on your your senior inter county career, Niall? I know twenty ones was good for you, and you went pretty much straight into the senior setup. How do you regard looking back now those years you had as a senior, considering you your career was was strong but you left you know you 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 left the scene maybe at a young age as well how do you regard it looking back now um i mean i look back on it very fondly like i think it's i think it's those things you kind of you kind of see your own personal journey and it's like i went from probably when i was started in the senior panel like i was not i felt like i was not good enough and then within two years i was like as good as anyone really defensively like and just I, I always look back on that as like a metaphor for anything else that I do in life where it's like sometimes like if you stick with things the, the you can really rise and um and like your fortune can change pretty quickly so and I guess like I have a good few friends as well from that time and just to spend time in such an Irish culture like culturally like to spend such uh, time in a, in an Irish um, community like that of of people from the same county as me, like I, I have so much appreciation for it. Like it's wild, yeah. And I I kind of don't think of the games so much. I just think of the 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 journey of it all, you know, and the ups and downs. I wanted to speak to a bit a bit. I wanted to speak to you a bit about your playing position back then. You were a defender. I remember you kicking a few points against Kerry in Crow Park, actually in a league quarter final or a league semi final a couple of years ago and a league semi final yeah two points from play i think I, I wanted to talk to you a bit about your position and the and, and you were a cornerback or a full back yeah. a defender anyway and and now you're an artist i wanted to talk to you a little bit about the art of defending and like how the mind works for a defender what is the art of defending would you say i think i always defended it from an attacking position um so which which would sometimes get you into a little bit of trouble because you're you're kind of always trying to take the the front position you know um so i definitely think like i wasn't a conservative defender at all <laughs> um and at the same time like it is art like defending is is an art because you need to kind of really understand space and you need to understand you're kind of trying to read other people's intentions all the time and like you're observing everything, um, you have to be a good observer to be a to be like a fullback, I think. Um, so like, I yeah, think that, you, have, you have to be intelligent. You have to be intelligent, and you have to, you have to understand movement. I I wonder how as a defender you deal with movement of a of a of a forward. Is that where the art lies? Do you think? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Like it's it's kind of like you're trying to you're trying to not be reacting. You're tr almost. It's almost like you're trying to take the first step because you know where the ball is about to be kicked. Um, so I think like you, you're definitely trying to read either the kicker and the forward and not be reacting to them, like trying to, to take their space before, before they want to, you know? And I think that's the way I always defend it, like, um, which, as I said, like was was when it worked, it was spectacular. But there was you come up against good players. There's a bit of risk. Yeah, there's a bit of risk. Yeah, exactly. exactly. I think you know Tom O'Sullivan from Kerry. Um, I remember watching him as a 
as a maybe 15, 16 year old. And I think that's very much the way he defended. He was an out in front sort of an attacking defender. And I was very inspired watching him uh, that time. And I think like in some ways I tried to, to, I think watching him taught me a lot about how I'd like to defend too. Yeah, Tom was excellent. He was very quick for a start. He could recover. He could take risks because he, he knew he could recover easily because he did unbelievable recovery pace. So that allowed him to take a few more risks out in front. But he was confident as well. He had a lot of personality and a confident kind of personality that wasn't wasn't afraid of taking on the risk of taking a chance of anticipating, you know. Um, in terms of, you mentioned some of those good players you marked, Neil. Take me through some of the names and who would you regard as being the toughest to try and read or the toughest to try because a lot of those top inside forwards are like artists in, the, in their own right I think of Gooch my, my old teammate Colin Cooper total artistic minded huge imagination and intuition what was it like marking some of these top guys who were they? Um, I suppose probably the three the three best players that I marked were probably the Gooch um, Michael Murphy and Damien Comer from Galway um, and I have to say like I kind of laughed out, but like trying to mark Damien Comer from Galway was a uh, <laughs> was a total nightmare. I have to say, and it's funny I can laugh about that now because I wasn't laughing at the time. Um, he was kind of everything that um, he he could catch the ball high, low, and he'd run through you. He wouldn't run around you. He'd run through you to get either. So. Just very unpredictable, uh, but could also um, could really take you on physically, and and so I, to be honest, I think he was the 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 most difficult fella I ever was coming across, because um, a lot of defenders like say, or a, a lot of attackers like if you're good in the air, and the, a lot of attackers are good, very good at one thing. And then you have people like Murphy and 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 the Gooch who who can really do do all those things. Um, and I think at the time, like Damien Comer was young, so he was dynamic and and able to do all those things as well. Yeah, three, two. I would say Murphy and Comer are quite similar. Maybe Gooch are probably a different a different kettle of fish in terms of the physicality and well, still a physical player, but um, probably use more movement and imagination in his game than the others, which is. A different type of challenge, I suppose, a less physical challenge, right? Yeah, exactly. And I like when I was mar- when I marked the Gooch, I remember just he was really trying to dictate to me off the ball more so. Sometimes he mightn't even be looking for the ball, but he was he was thinking of the greater good and trying to create space for other people. So like where maybe he wasn't getting the ball that much. He was still being very influential in opening up the space because I was playing full back. And I guess like if, if he knew he could dislodge me, then he was creating big space for someone else. So like, yeah, like a level of intelligence there that probably took me by surprise a little bit. Yeah, yeah, highly intelligent guy. Um, uh, I just want to talk about your education as a, for, as a footballer one and as a person too, and your time in DCU. You, you studied sports science in DCU. How much, how much did that time in DCU teach you as a footballer? Oh, yeah. Like, um, when I look back on DCU, like, the last thing I think, think of is sports science. I think of football and I think of, like, um, social life but I don't necessarily mean social life in the traditional sense of like going out drinking not or, or partying not that at all almost like the extracurricular stuff um was like was like the beginning of almost realizing that like life is so abundant and there's so many different kind of types of people and um things you can spend your time at um but football wise like sure we were it was at a time where um, pretty much the best footballers in Ireland were all playing in DCU, and they had um, the best, some of the best coaches in in Ireland uh, training us. So it was like it was almost like being a full time footballer for four years. Who were some of those guys you're talking about? Some of the best footballers in Ireland. When we won the Sigerson in 2012, like the defence was um, like I I was playing wing back, but 
like Johnny Cooper and James McCarthy were the other two um, uh, halfbacks. Um, like Paul Flynn was was uh, half forward. Colin Begley, Fintan O'Curran, Michael Murphy. That like just uh, uh, there's more lads that I miss it out on. Just so many good players like um, Carl Craig and and David Keane. Donny Shine from Roscommon. There was just so many good players, and it was like it really made you like learn from from excellence, really. Um, so as a footballer, it really was playing professionally for four years. Yeah, like an intercounty team with those names. Uh, in terms of the sports science degree, obviously sports science has become a huge part of team prep and player preparation. It's become like a real culture part of this GA culture now. For better or for worse, there's there's obviously a balance at play in terms of preparing individuals and teams. Uh, given that you were an artist, do you do you see do you see Gaelic football as more on the more of a science or an art? Um, that's very that's a very good question. I think it's probably at the point now where it's almost like. It's it's kind of come sort of full circle in some ways where it's probably well positioned between the two of them. I think maybe ten years ago it was like a science, right? And I think that actually suited me to be honest for for a while because I was probably um, physically capable. Um, but I think now in the last couple of years, I think it started to mix the two very well and I see it now as more I see the good teams now as like it's almost like the science they respect and they take the science very seriously they're incredibly conditioned but to win it's the it's the art you know and I think the best players and the best teams always always like focus on the art as much as the as the science I mean the level of skill now. Yeah, I think you're right. I think that's a, I think that's a great answer. It is it's almost like the conditioning is obviously very important, but it's like all the teams can probably match each other some ways in that. So it's like you're not going to get ahead a whole pile with that. It's going to be the 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 art side of the game. Yeah, I think you're right. I think I think you're right. I think there's a balance at the moment. There's a nice balance at the moment in terms of uh, your own practice. Neil and your own art and your work as an artist do you see there being similarities or crossovers between your 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 football playing your defend Neil Collins the defender and Neil Collins the artist Neil Collins the athlete and Neil Collins the artist is there is there any are there any synergies um it's it's hard to know I feel like my style of art is definitely playful I mean you can see some background it's definitely bright and it's optimistic and it's colorful and I think probably as a person um, and as a sports person I kind of that's probably the my that's the way my my personality was um at that time too and in terms of the actual in terms of the in sorry but in terms of the actual um practice of it in the act of doing your art like I sometimes I remember speaking to you before about the movements, your movements that you make as an artist and the energy that you you put into paintings and that kind of thing. And it just kind of struck me that there may be some similarities between the, the, the athlete and the energy you put into athletics or Gaelic football or training or gym and the movements that as a defender you would have to make or the movements a forward would make on the field compared to kind of the act of actually pa painting one of those big canvases that you do. Yeah, it's like, it's it's it, it clicks with me now. It's like... Both are quite instinctive and both are, are not necessarily coming from your head. They're just coming from like sort of like when you play football, that's the beauty of it. Like you kind of leave your head behind in some ways. Like you, you, you go into autopilot in that way and you kind of just like start to act, right? And you just start to do things that you know are right, but you're not necessarily, you know, thinking about it too long. And I think that's what good art is as well. I think it's coming from, it's not coming from the mind. Um, it might be coming via the mind, but it's like, it's coming from kind of an instinctive, um, kind of like primitive place within you that you just know what's like the right movement or the right 
kind of flow to get into it. Is is it like, is it like a reaction? Is it like a reaction to something? Yeah, it is. Yeah. Yeah. You're kind of like trying to actually take your head out of the way and just let it kind of come and not think about it too much. And also what I was going to say there is that like exercise is a huge part of my day, like where, um, it's like I, I'm always look, I always like set an hour aside for exercise here here in my workspace. So whether it's just stretching or going out for a run, it's like it's like those two work really well together because it's like you're energizing your body and you're kind of like getting yourself into a good mental state too. Yeah, you change the energy system within you as well. Yeah, yeah, and it's like you're yeah exactly. And, and you're you're trying to it's like you're igniting your animal a little bit and just like um which i think at this point in time like we're taught really that our minds are like will get us ahead but i think for certain people it's like um they're maybe they're not so head or mind centered and like maybe they're more body and heart centered and that's sort of what i feel so I think that's why, why that serves me well. Yeah. Tell me, I'm wondering about like how your education served you in terms of your art now, your life as an artist now. Like, do you feel like you went down quite an academic route? Now you're in a non-academic kind of a place. Um, how do you look back at your second and third level time? Do you kind of look back and think maybe I should have done art or some kind of art course? Or are you on your path that you're supposed to be on? Yeah um excellent question i feel like so there's a i have a mentor like um who i speak to a lot when i have challenges saying that way and he always says to me like when i mentioned the past he was like you were you were searching and you were looking and you were like um you were living your life as it was as you felt that it was right to do at the time and i think it's very interesting now and i really think about this a lot i think about like the dynamics and the norms that we grow up in and how they shape our decisions um until maybe we have the maturity and the maybe research reading and learning done to realize that like a lot of the things you're taught maybe are not the way for you um are are not like someone else's norms can't should not be your norms and so when I think about like my time going to university and that, and I was trying to probably like live and make decisions based on the norm of society at the time, but not necessarily based on what was right for me. So I think like, I feel, I mean, I feel like it's interesting to see how I've gone from like being very much like doing what's expected of me um to now realizing that like i can only serve myself and what i expect from myself yeah no i think it is definitely like it adds to your experience and i think looking at the past as research is a great way to look at the past rather than question it or kind of you know doubt you know doubt it or whatever i think just look at it as research is a good way to good way to kind of frame it i wanted to touch on something you mentioned there about that time a couple of years ago we we spoke through a mutual friend of ours you were looking for a little bit of uh just uh direction and kind of information on the whole f- fashion the fashion world right and um how do you feel about this compatibility or, or or incompatibility that exists between the gaa world that you and i both grew up in and competed in and were part of and are still part of really because it never leaves you really and the world that i'd say your art world my business in design and fashion and you you've crossed over into fashion as well of course how, how do you feel about that kind of culture clash does it is it is it still what it was when we spoke five or six years ago or has it changed a little bit you think i think it's always evolving but but i, I have to say i would say it i would say it's evolving very slowly and i would say that in terms of mixing like my mindset now with that sport mindset would be very very tricky i don't think it would work at all basically um i think like you you why why do you say that you wouldn't be able to create you wouldn't be as free in your mind probably yeah i think like 
uh, team dynamics and sports in, in sports, like especially a team like that where you know there's there could be 40, 50 members of a of a panel, um, including staff, you know. Um, it's like you really have to be on the same page mentally in a lot of ways as other and mindset wise. And I feel like as a creator, um, as a designer, as an artist, um, I feel like you're you're kind of like on your own path and you're you don't really you question things a lot and you um seek the truth a lot you know so it's very, I feel like it's very difficult to be in an environment where where everyone is very much like buying into exactly the same thing because your only or my only position is to to observe and question everything <laughs> and like it's 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 they're just very different dynamics to sport you know and and that's not to say that that the sport one is wrong like it's just it's just very different so i i i i just don't see yeah i don't I just don't think it works personally yeah um you and i spoke about i'm a, i'm a big fan I read a lot about Harry Boland. You and I have spoken a bit about Harry Boland and about Jack B. Yeats. I do think there was a time where the world of art and kind of, let's say, style and the GA were actually all the one. And Harry Boland kind of personifies it for me. He was a trained tailor. Obviously, he was a politician slash activist. And he was the subject of a Jack B. Yeats painting, the funeral of Harry Boland, the scene of his burial in, in Glasnevin. And I think that's a great kind of a, that's the Ireland I kind of think about, that cultural mix of sport and politics and art and all those things combined. Um, that's the reason I ask about that compatibility or lack of compatibility and where it stands today. Uh, we're going to wrap up on this. Sorry, go, go. No, I think it's really interesting because like when people think of Ireland, I've got a lot of American friends and like, they're always referencing like James Joyce and, and, and Oscar Wilde. Uh, Harry Boland's a great reference point for us, for us guys. And this chat is about reference points, creating new rep reference points for young people, people like yourself who are, have gone the academic route but decided to go the non-academic route as well and is making a go of that. I think it's important to have both and I think it's important then to have reference points. And I think someone like Harry Boland is a, is a good reference point actually for men outside of the more artistic kind of like you know, he's played played hurling for Dublin, competed in all, an All Ireland final, trained in all, trained the UCD Collegians to win the All Ireland hurling title, refereed an All Ireland football final between Kerry and Wexford. Uh, he had a tailor shop on Abbey Street where he used to make suits for Collins, De Valera, all those leaders. This was a drop off point for messengers as well, so it was actually a station. His shop, and then there was the the politics side. He was an ambassador to the states as well. Um, and he was, you're right, you're right. Not Roscommon was his, his constituency, is right, yeah, yeah. Uh, he, had, he had the Russian crown jewels, you know. He brought the Russian crown jewels, smuggled the Russian crown jewels home from New York to, to Cove, right, and brought them to Dublin. They were collateral. Him and, him and De Valera raised $5.5 million back in uh, 1922, the equivalent of $55 million today. They, they raised it for the Republican movement, and this, the, the Russians under Lenin's leadership were in were in New York at the same time and the Russians heard about these Irish guys raising all this money and the Irish guys gave the Russians 20 grand for their revolution and as collateral Boland took the Russian crown jewels he brought them back to Ireland and they were actually hidden in his mom his mom's chimney in Fairview or, or in Marino or somewhere they were hidden in his mom's chimney for like decades until as part of another election some years later they were raised again somebody well there was a politician who had been in New York as an ambassador with and heard about, knew about it and raised it and the jewels were found in the chimney and returned to the Russians. Yeah, he is like, I think that, that ambassadorial espionage was part of his life as well. I think he's a good reference for guys like us, you know. But um, Yeah, rule breakers. Rule breakers and, and people who, who make their own rules in some yeah, ways. You know? Yeah, rule makers as, as much as rule breakers, I think. Yeah. Neil, I'm going to leave you... I'm going to leave you at one question. It touches upon a similar note, right? And it's about this relationship between sport and art and the part in between. Jack B. Yates, who we bought, you're a big fan of. I'm interested in. I read a little bit about, I think, another reference, kind of important reference point. But anyway, he won Ireland's first ever Olympic medal, right? Paris Games, 1924. Won a silver for 
paint, his painting in the arts and culture section. Liff, Liffy Swim was the was the did the work. You know the work. Is that is that how relevant is Jack B. Yeats a silver medal in today's Ireland? Do you think? I mean, I think it should be more relevant than it is. I feel like Ireland, as I said there, it's like we have all these incredible international shapers of like philosophy and um, of word and poetry and music. And I feel like in this Ireland, it's like we don't, we've kind of like left that where it is, you know, it's like that's part of our past, but it, it doesn't seem to be part of our future. Um, and I think like that's such, it's, it's so true as well. It's about like the, the art was recognized in the Olympics. And I think that's almost to recognize its, its power and its worth. Um, and I feel like, I think like I, we should, or like Ireland as a country culturally should really like put more of an emphasis on its arts because I, I think like that's what you, that's what people remember. That's what like travels internationally. Um, and like our Irish people have a, um, like a, a, a panache and skill for that. Um, and I think it's probably something that, that we should probably encourage and nurture more in Ireland for sure. Yeah, I think I think that's a great answer. It's a perfect way. It perfectly kind of frames what this whole series is about. To be honest with you, it's about actually um, maybe shining a new light on the fact that yeah, our, our art was once an Olympic sport. We have a silver Olympic medal for it, and that you know reference points like 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 Jack Yates is is a good one for the, for the, for the new the new breed of young man growing up. I think that's why you're. It's important to speak to someone like you as well because you're like the new breed of that artist who kind of crosses over the divide between between art and sport and creates culture uh, so that's why I feel like you're a cultural leader good for young young men especially that are in stu- schools at the moment maybe unsure about what they want to do or, or if they can do what they want to do and I think you're right and when, when you say that maybe curriculums and second and third level bodies well second level bodies more so could maybe cater more for the creative arts possibly you know um, especially now with the world we live in so Neil, that's a great way to wrap it up. I wanted to just touch on your website where all your art is available. I, I own some and I think it's one of the best things. It's one of the best things in my home and one of the best things I've bought. And I know you've got more great work on the way and it's, I think it's important that you get support and, and solidarity in doing what you're doing and taking the, taking the step that you, you took to, to, to create these pieces. So your art can be found on your Instagram, some on your Instagram, but more so on neilpatrickcollins.com, right? Yeah. Thanks for joining us. Keep going. You have all Perfect. our you have you have all our support. You'll be at the Olympics soon. <laughs> yeah, yeah, hopefully we'll get it back in. <laughs> yeah, we're gonna go for that, man. That's gonna be our mission, all right? Amazing in a in a in like a running sleeveless top. So I'll have the, the athlete's body and the artist's. Yeah, put on the Ross put on the Ross Common jersey. Oh, that was one man I meant to speak to you about was another cultural leader I feel is uh, another Ross Common man, Sean Mulryan. Obviously has promote or has sponsored your, your teams that you played on for a long time. How do you see him? How do you relate to him as a Roscommon man? Um, I feel like he's, he's, he's an incredible, he's just an incredible mind, first of all, an incredible, like, cultural leader too. Like, he's a real artist and, like, creator, Sean Mulroyne is. Um, I was in, um, before I was in his, his um, office in, in town and, to see the the incredible artwork that's there and like a library of art books also um just kind of shows me that the likes of Sean Ryan really is 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 shaping community and people and and culture as well um so like that's kind of when I think of of Sean that's what I think of like I think of a lot of like real class and um kind of respect for 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 people and culture um and obviously like and, and like both internationally and then obviously like with with like his support for irish community and and gaelic games as well so i feel like he he just has the full spectrum of um intellect and perspective at a, at a, a very intelligent yeah, yeah. And I, I love i love what he does 
I love what he does at Ballymore, and I think he adds a lot to the urban kind of urban living, especially, and how and, and, and improves how people how people can live, which I think is just is is obviously commendable and admirable. But anyway, a good reference point for you possibly. Yeah. I think you're going to become one of these. I think you're going to become one of these figures for some young men in the country as well in what you're doing. And uh, I think the more of those that we have, the better. So, Neil, thanks for the chat. Really enjoyed it. Continued success. And uh, we'll, we'll keep supporting you. Thanks very much, Paul.